our Father and our God, we want to thank you. We bless your name for whom you are. We thank you because your spirit is here. We thank you, O oh God, because you give and you provide. We bless your holy name for wisdom, knowledge, and understanding. We thank you because your well of knowledge never dries. Glory, honor, and adoration be unto your name. My Lord and my God, I commit my tongue and my mouth into your hand that we make it as a ready pen of a pen writer that I will declare your word today in season in the name of Jesus. That people that hear me, oh God, they will not go the same way they have come in the precious name of Jesus. We glorify your holy name. Lord, I commit this venue into your hand to the north, to the east, and west, and the south. And I say, Lord, take preeminence. Amen. Take total control. Amen. Let your angels be on guard. Amen. Let your peoples receive from the throne of grace. Amen. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Amen. Thank you, Jesus Christ. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 In Jesus' name. I want to appreciate especially those who taught me fit to be a teacher here today. Uh, not minding that I'm a teacher at WBI, Wosem Bible Institute. I'm happy when I heard Pastor Sam teaching because I have this fight within my spirit that remember, Boston, you're going to be talking to people in the convention. You might not be at home your high valuing grammar, conceptual framework that you might be bringing forth. But you know, my job is made easier with what I heard Pastor Sam saying. He did not teach only as a preacher or a theologian. I can see a mixture of psychology and theology and biblical teaching in what he did. So I'm going to be riding on his back. Praise the name of the Lord. You will begin to understand what I meant. Our language may not be too different. I'm also happy for one thing. I'm going to be happy on just one word for about six or eight pages of document that I want to share with you. Attitude. Can everybody chorus it? Attitude. Can we say it again? Attitude. Let's say it once more. Attitude. By the grace of God, I discovered that anything you want to be or you want to become on this planet has start and ends with your attitude. So I'm not surprised by the planners of this convention or whoever are the organizers and the way they share the topic that they wanted me to talk about attitude as impediment. Pastor Sam dealt a lot with impediment. I'm going to be staying on my lane. Attitude as impediment be using prophet Jonah as our test case. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, attitude spans across so many scholastic regions. It covers so many base areas of knowledge, but I'm going to be dealing with four or five this morning. So please write profusely if you can. Jot things down. In human development, those that knows about social sciences. Attitude is a general and long-lasting positive or negative opinion or a feeling about a person, about an object, about a problem. It develops through our direct experiences, our social influence, or our media exposure. That's how you get the type of attitude you are showing. Most of the time, Attitude are your direct experiences. Let's go to social sciences. In the study of social anthropology, attitude that developed through the cultures and traditions that we have been exposed to over the years. As a Yoruba man, I know my attitude. We know our attitude. Praise the name of the law. Some of our attitude are in complete alignment with what we find ourselves in this Western Hemisphere. Am I right or wrong? The way we carry ourselves, the way we talk, the way we approach issues is quite in contradistinction to what we find ourselves where we are living now. And I know many of us suffer so much disalignment and collision before we begin to get our hearts together. 
Hello. Don't be too saintly about this. Am I right or wrong? Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. In social anthropology, that's, that, that, that's to tell you that attitude involves a set of emotions, beliefs, and behavior towards a particular object, a person, a thing, or an event. So, in summary, as anthropologists will tell you, it is the way you think, it is the way you perceive, it is the way you feel, but on a permanent basis in relation to something, and it greatly influences the behavior of you, you that person, to the stimulus that you see, to the environment that you find yourself. So, your attitude may be negative, it might be positive. Praise the name of the Lord. In linguistics, I'm going to weave everything together, don't worry. We need to go to the root word of the word attitude. In terms of etymology, the root word for attitude is taken from a Latin word, aptus, A-P-T-U-S. And it simply means in English language, ability. So, you can see, attitude is more than you think. It is more than what people call behavior. It is more than what people call disposition. It is inbuilt. It is your ability. Sometimes it is internal. So, our established way of thinking or feeling, which is reflected in our behaviors towards others, is called attitude. It is the built, inbuilt tendency we have that is making us to respond to, to certain stimulus in different ways. It might be an object, it might be an occasion, it might be a situation. When some people put up certain attitude to you, you begin to wonder, is it more than this? You know that you by word, kilagbe kilaju. What's going on? Praise the Lord. I'm just asking you a question. Why should it turn into a fight? Attitude. Praise the Lord. It also influences our choices, our actions, our likes and our dislikes. It is what we believe in, especially when we come into the, into the subject of faith. Attitude is what we believe in. If you don't understand, I will make a clear expression today. It is how you feel about your faith. The book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1 says that faith is what? Substance of things hoped for. And the evidence of things that have not been seen. But our problem as Christians and believers is that at the end of the day, the attitude we put on belies our faith context. Hello? Are people of God following me? Your attitude towards God is not what you are displaying. And until you begin to reorientate yourself, until you begin to reform your attitude every day, to that level of faith that God desired for you, you will still be struggling as people of faith. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So overall, I'm just building the background. Attitude is an evaluative statement. It's a kind of judgment that we make every day of our lives about people, about objects, about events or things. I take myself as an example. I like C.A.C. Wilson. Likeness is the attitude in that statement. But I can say I love WBI. Love is my attitude towards WBI. And those in my team at WBI means that, knows that I love WBI to death. That's my attitudinal disposition towards my community of learners. But one thing that I want us to see today is, is our attitude displaying our actions? Can we see alignment between our actions and our attitude? In most cases, there are always disalignments. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And I need you to be following me right now. Because like I told you, attitudes are inbuilt tendencies and they will determine or influence your values. Either you are a minister, either you are a child of God, either you are a just coming Christian, a nominal Christian, or a staunch Christian at that point, you know, your attitude will determine what you will do for God. So the irony of the challenge is this. Yes, you can see my, you know, outward disposition. You can see my behavior, you can see my character. 
but can you know what is inside of me as my attitude? Hello? That's why you see some people praise the name of the Lord in front of their ministers, their lawyers, high service members, but inside of them, they are killers, they are rebellious. Hello, people of God. See, they don't want to answer me anymore. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. They are always standing against each other because we fail to realize that attitude is great to our journey of faith. I remember, I, wasn't, I, I was very young, but I remember the song, especially in southwestern Nigeria. You know, action group, NCNC, Nigeria Council for Cameroons and Northern so, 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 so. You know those parties? And the AG people has a song that they normally sing. Borino me, orokan me, demamowa. It means, very simple, I may not tell you that I don't belong to NCNC, but inside of me, I know I'm a staunch member of Action Group. Praise the name of the Lord. That's how attitude works. Attitude is so silent that when people behave or carry themselves unto you, you think they are saints. You think they are angelic, but inside of them, they are devils that you should run away from. Is somebody catching my point today? Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And I'm going to explain it on three tripod, on a tripod point. Attitude is built on three major pillars. Number one, Pastor Sam said it's emotion. It also sits on behavior and it sits upon your cognition. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Cognitive part of attitude is your opinion or belief statement about anything. You can believe stuff, you can say stuff. It resides here in your frontal uh, uh, part of your brain. That's where cognition resides. Praise the name of the Lord. But if it comes to affection, that is the emotion that Pastor Sam was talking about. You can feel it. We can see it. Do you know that uh, in Yoruba land, again, I'm sorry to be using this example. It was because I grew up there. They would be telling you that shut up this woman, Asukun, Praise the name of the Lord. She was just crying to make her case unto you. But she said, blood and liar. What you see outside is not what is happening between her and the husband. Praise God. Praise the Lord. I'm sorry, I'm using women as example. You better say hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. The one that is mostly seen is behavior. Our outward physical exhibition. Which fools people all of the time. It's just a display. It's not the real one. You know, in the book of Isaiah that was given as part of our central text. Isaiah 54 verse 17. You know, it, 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 God presents us with his prophetic assurance. That is more than able to remove every form of impediment against our achievement. On the contrary, I'm going to be going to Prophet Jonah's test case now. His own case involves us to be aware. He's inviting us to be aware of the attitude we possess which can impede the program of God for our lives. I want you to please follow me carefully now. Either as ministers that you are seated here, Either as a worker in ministry, we need to extray what happened to Prophet Jonah so that we understand the meaning of attitude as impediment. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So this will give us a reflective opportunity as ministers, as workers and children of God to carefully explore and investigate our attitude to the work of God. That's the reason why I'm here today. You may be doing it somewhere else or somehow else, but let us look at it today with the lens of Jonah. From this point, I need you to start looking at your offerings, at your ministerial services from the lens of Prophet Jonah. And I'm very sorry if I'm coming this way. I know I have senior pastors here. I know I have senior ministers here, but this is the word of God. Just take me as I am. That's what the Spirit is telling me to tell you. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. 
if you look at the background to the book of Jonah in itself in the Bible, he was a prophet from Gath Hepha. H E P H E R. It's a village in, in Nazareth, Israel. And Bible history recalls that the book of Jonah was written around 760 BC. Incredibly, listen to this. Research showed that God had highly given Jonah the privilege of delivering good news that Israel will experience time of safety and prosperity. You can go into the book of 2 Kings and see that. I may not be able to give you a chance to read. 2 Kings 14.25. That was during the reign of Jeroboam II, 790 to 749 BC. Praise the name of the Lord. That Jeroboam II is different from Jeroboam the one. There are two Jeroboams, kings in the Bible. You know? So, what I'm trying to do here, before I go into the book of Jonah, is the fact that Jonah knows God. So, what we saw him doing in the book of Jonah is unlike Jonah that we knew before. And just like Pastor Sam wonders this morning, most of our problems that acted as impediment, they are right in our history. Can you say history? Genealogy. Can you say genealogy? Lineage. Can you say lineage? It's right there. There is a need for consecutive investigation. And this is telling me again, especially for Christians that are carrying me all over the world, there is always a connection between the Old and the New Testament just to suffice for us to know and say that indeed the Bible is a complete story. I, you know, I marvel and I was, I'm surprised when some people will be calling themselves New Testament church, <laughs> Old Testament church. Who are they deceiving? They're deceiving themselves. The word of God is one and the same from Genesis to Revelation. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Now let's bring it home because we're going to be asking ourselves some soul-searching questions. What is your attitude to life? You don't need to answer me. Just listen very carefully. What is your attitude to life? It is either you are a grateful creature of God, showing gratitude every day, that by smelling the aura of money in time, you know that God has been good to you. No matter what you have passed through in the night before. It is either the attitude of ingratitude, attitude of ingratitude. I'm not repeating myself. It's not tautology. It's either attitude of complaint. No matter what God does for some people, it's always Oliver Twist. Father, do me this, do me that. Praise the name of the Lord. Number two, what is your attitude to giving? I'm just citing some, some instances. Are you a generous person? Are you open-handed? Are you miserly? Are you stingy? Answer yourself. Are you tight-fisted? Nothing can come out of your hand. Every time is just to lay bear your hand to receive from people. Search yourself, people of God. Number three. What is your attitude to God's work? In the book of Mark, chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, like I said, I may not have the luxury of uh, uh, having you to read the Bible portion. You know, Jesus... He exposed the attitude of the religious leader of his time. They were fighting him for doing what? For doing miracles. We are asked what he was doing is to set the people of God into liberty. There are people like that. That do not want you to see what God has in stock for you in terms of goodness. Do you know that there are ministers like that? Hello, people of God. Do you know that there, there are career prophets like that? Especially if you get hooked to them, instead of going with one problem to them, they had ten, so that you can come perpetually. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. And finally, what is your attitude to constituted authority? Whether government, whether church, whether workplace, anywhere where you have to report, what is your attitude? Are you lawyer? Like I said, or you do do I service. Hey, God, Pastor. Pastor, you monkey. Praise the name of the Lord. Outward obedience, but internal 
rebellion. Let's do a little bit of content analysis. I love to do this because the Bible is very rich. And we're going to be dealing only with the book of Jonah. In chapter 1, it's just a summary. We read of the first call of God unto Jonah. We read about his disobedience. We read about his attitude of adversity for souls at Nineveh. Remember that God wanted him to go and preach so that the people of God can be delivered from their evil ways. He was adverse to that, opposed to that. He did not like the plan of redemption of God for his people. Ah. We saw the consequences of his disobedience, including the adversity that is caused for other passengers. You remember in the boat? Instead of going to Nineveh, he boarded the ship going to Tarshish. And he caused them problem. People were, you know, were crying in the boat. There were businessmen that were going to lose a lot of fortune. They all said, can, can we ask you this man? Where are you from? What is your work? You are just sleeping in the midst of this calamity. Who are you, by the way? Praise the name of the Lord. That is how you, 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 you begin to identify attitudes. Can we repeat it again? Attitudes. When we are running elter skelter, let us do evangelism. That is when you want to go to bed and sleep. Ah. It is dangerous. It is contrary to our mission. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. You know, in the second chapter, I want to do a quick uh, 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 review of what we have in the book of Jonah. In the, in the, in the chapter, uh, in, in the second chapter rather, that appears to me to be the center of Jonah's calamity. Because he disobeyed, he has to suffer. That's the dangerous part of bringing out bad attitude unto God's work. He offered serious prayers to God because God imprisoned him for some time in the belly of a fish. Although he got his deliverance, as God commanded the fish finally to deliver him at Nineveh shore. You know, when you go into the book of Jonah chapter 2 verses 1 to 9, I, I think verses 7 and 8 actually catch my fancy. When he was praying, as if he doesn't know what he did, he said, when my soul fainted within me, I remember the Lord, and my prayer went up unto you, into your holy temple. Those who regard worthless idols, ah, they forsake their own mercy. That's the word of Jonah. You know, when you, you know when you reach a junction in life and you think everything is finished, you pray like no man's business. He knows that in the darkness of that, of that fish belly, there is no way for him to escape from God. May you never suffer that experience in the mighty name of Jesus. But sometimes, some people need that kind of experience to be able to know that God is actually God. That's exactly what happened to Jonah. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. In the book of Jonah chapter 3, God called him the second time. Our loving God. He called Jonah, go to inside Nineveh. I know you are now at the beach, at the shore. Preach repentance. He obeyed at this time. And we saw the consequence of his obedience, right? The Nevites, they repented and God spared the city of his judgment. So, it validated one thing again. In the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 29, the Bible says, the gift and callings of God are irrevocable. Praise the name of the Lord. Whatever God says he will do, he will surely do. Whether you, 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 you don't want to come out of your mother's belly, you still want to be there until Jesus comes. Whatever God says you will do, you will come out, you will do it. That's how God works. The call of God is irrevocable. Praise the name of the Lord. And in this chapter 3, I saw our loving God. He is merciful. He did not deal with Jonah according to his own undoing. I had my GS, you know, my senior pastor talking yesterday. 
that Jonah is wicked. Jonah is not kind. You understand? I, 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 I combined all of them to be undoings because it should not even be mentioned in the ears of a minister. Ah, a minister of God and you had God directly. Go and speak to my people that they may be delivered from their evil ways. You are the one running Elta Skelter. You don't know that God is higher than your thought. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Chapter 4, centered on Jonah's hunger and dislike for God's favor. That's all about chapter 4 on the Nineveh. He literally complained to God that he knew that God will have mercy on them anyway. And there is no need for him to come and preach to the Nineveh. And that's why he fled to Tashis in the first instance. What an attitude. Can you say what an attitude? You see, they cannot speak loudly. What an attitude, especially from a clergy. What is your first work in any case? Why are you called? Is it not that you may be able to deliver people from their thought and their perdition and you are running around? So he knows how to pray in chapter 2. And God delivered him. He went back again in chapter 3, complaining and complainant. I'm not repeating myself. He knows how to complain. He's a chief complainant. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. When you study Jonah chapter 4, verses 1 to 3 very well, okay, let us open this and read it together. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Quickly, quickly, Jonah 4, 1 to 3, let's read it together. Jonah 4, 1, 2, 3. Let's read it together in chorus. Let's go, let's go. Uh -huh. Yes, uh-huh. Exactly. Uh-huh. Exactly. Uh-huh. In mercy, yes. Ah, <laughs> uh -huh. praise the name of the Lord. Close your eyes. Let us pray this prayer. You are going to tell God as you are seated there. <laughs> every power, every human being, born of a woman no matter how they were even born, that are rejecting the program of God for my salvation. As they have said, let them die. Visit them with death. Begin to pray in the name of Jesus. There are people like Jonah, I'm just telling you. And they are not happy about the program of God for your salvation, for my salvation. That God should visit them with death. In the name of Jesus. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Let it be unto them. As they have said. And so shall it be. In Jesus most powerful name. We have prayed. Praise the name of the Lord. So if you listen to me up to this point. One thing that I see about attitude is an alignment with an, a language that we understand in the secular world. Can you say ethics? Can you please say ethics? You know, whether you belong to the medical profession, you are an accountant, you are a business administrator, it doesn't matter. There are always standard of practice, right? That you need to follow. And they are always morally given. Hmm? Depending on the type of work that you are doing. Dr. Aluku is a medical doctor. Am I correct? I can never see you or imagine you wearing a babariga or agbada into a theater. It's impossible. Praise the name of the Lord. Because he will mess himself up. Sometimes they are not developed out of any esoteric knowledge. They are developed in a way that your work and practice may be easy. It will be too complicated for him. We are bad into a theater room. Praise the name of the Lord. 
praise the name of the Lord. So, so in our ethics, right, there will be codes, moral codes. Even our speech, the way we should talk, you know. I heard Pastor Abraham talking to us yesterday that our word must be seasoned with salt. Ah, this Bible is complete. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So everything that I want to be talking on right now are what I consider as examples of attitude that we need to develop so that we don't impede our own progress in ministry. So that we don't impede our own progress in the journey of faith. Am I speaking to somebody? Hello? If you don't speak, I will not continue. Are you, are, are you hearing me? Yes. Praise the Lord! Until we begin to see this, that Christianity is a profession. Ah, it's a way of life that has its code, that has its ethics. Ethics come from the Latin word ethos. And it means standard. Praise the name of the Lord. So doing things hogwash, the way you come, the way I do it. Uh, 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 our God is greatest than that. I'm not saying greater, he's greatest than that. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Number one, desist from greed or avarice. You may be thinking, where are we landing ourselves now? Just follow me through. I'm going to be on a shave shop. Greed or avarice. Desist from personal aggrandizement. Unlimited material acquisition. Especially on the platform of ministry. Hello. Ministry is an institution established by God as a mystery to serve his people. It's not for your personal aggrandizement. It will not do you any good. And those who did not work for it will also inherit it at the end. That's what many people don't understand. Acquisition of wealth. I want to build coca house cocoa house, even here in New York I want to build one in California may you not just run and struggle to death in the name of Jesus this is from that, rather as a wise man I need to borrow you from the book of Ecclesiastics right now, Ecclesiastes 11, 1 to 2 says cast your bread upon the waters for you will find it after many days give a serving to seven and also unto it, for you do not know what evil will be on the earth. Praise the name of the Lord. What does that mean? Scatter your possessions. Give out. You don't know who we serve. And you don't know who you are bringing up. That's one thing. God is waiting to bless his people. So that it will be a gateway for blessing so many other people. Praise the name of the Lord. No wonder that the Bible says we are the one who will inherit, you know, the wealth of the Gentiles. The Bible knows what he's talking about. But of what use will it be to you if you are personally aggrandizing everything? Praise the name of the Lord. Don't be a talkative. Number two, it's as simple as that. Don't talk too much. Whether you are a minister, you are a grown Christian, you are a nominal Christian. In the multitude of talking, you will be led into sin. It's as simple as that. Please keep your mouth. If there is no need to talk, keep mute. And if there is opportunity to talk, talk less. In the book of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verses 3 to 4. The senior apostle, Paul, was advising his, uh, his junior minister, Timothy, that, look, remain in Ephesus. I just need you to teach Jesus-centered sound doctrines. In, in theology, we call that Christology. Just teach about Jesus and his sound doctrine. Ensure that you desist from engaging in fables, in endless genealogies, which causes disputes which brings up questions rather than godly edification and faith. Many ministers, 
Many teachers, let us listen to this. Let us teach to exhort people of God. Don't let us teach in a way that we bring argument. Genealogy that you see there is argument that has no fruit. Argument that is not productive. Conversation that is not adding to the body of Christ. And that's what many ministers are engaging in. I wrote it here. These days, many ministers are becoming public speakers. Instead of preaching or acting as ministers of God. Dr. Akifeleye will tell you there is a course specifically for communications for leaders in our own Bible school. Because we have seen how people just come to the altar, talk trash, talk empty, nothing added, and they go. And we also give them an honorarium. Praise the name of the Lord. See, they are not, they are not shouting hallelujah. Shout hallelujah. Their message is divide of spirit infused words. They come up more with personal stories and experiences that does not exhort or encourage the people of God. In contrary to proclamation or declaring, which is the root word of preach, because that's what God has assigned us to do. Preach means exhort, build up, you know, declare my good news. What do they do to do? They stand to promote and they market their own secular abilities. That's what they are turning the altar of God to. May the Lord have mercy on us. In the precious name of Jesus. Number three. Remember we are trying to build up some example of attitude that will impede. You know, that may impede. That will impede ministry. Ministerial growth. Our Christian growth. That's what I'm talking about. Losing the servant's heart is the third point. If you continue, you know, you should continue to ask God rather in your prayers and mutations every day. In your prayers and your meditations every day. Lord, do you still have a servant heart in me? I'm telling you, you need it. Am I committing to making those around me a success? Because you are a servant. You are to serve people. Lord, can I say I, am, I regard myself as lesser than, than other people around me? Can I picture myself in that way? That I'm bringing myself down so that they can come up. One of American speakers is a pastor. He just died in this year, 2024. In Long Grief, tells us the name of the man is Reverend Bobby Moore. There is one of his phrases that catch my attention. He says, any problem can be solved. If people have a servant heart, so there will be no, I don't accept you, you don't accept me. It will not be a fight to finish. Especially if there is one servant heart among the two parties. It's a matter of time. There will be a resolution. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So this lack of servant heart is what is causing problem among Christian brethren. Let me tell you, I'm not going to lie. I'm on the altar of God. Pastor Abraham is here, if you remember. It took me a long time to accept that time that I'm a servant of God. Ah, the same thing that the Muslim will say, Eru Allah, name me. Ah, praise the name of the Lord. It took me a long time until I dig deeper into the Bible. Oh, okay. He's telling me that I need to serve the people of God. Not necessarily that I am a servant of God. So if you are calling people servant of God, they are actually servant of you before they become servant of God. Is somebody catching my attention? That's how it should be. So if you are a pastor here, I'm sorry to say, if you are a minister here and you are not going to bend down your back to serve people, you do not have a place in terms of impediment. Hello? Hello, Ashanu. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. It took me a long time to accept that servant tag as a Christian minister. I, I, I brooded over it, meditated over it, mutated over it so many times. Ah, ah. At this day, servant, servant, again, about to lost it in Muslim. Ah, ah. Servant. Praise the name of the Lord. 
Number four, when you rely too much on your natural gift and abilities, you can quote it, relying on your natural gift and abilities. That's number four point. So, my point is very clear. If we begin to have human explanation for our stride in ministry, if we are soaked in how impressive our work appears in the eyes of men, and not realizing that it will be put to test of fire, then we are missing the mark greatly. I'm telling you, in the work of that late evangelist and English author, he's also an Anglican clergyman. The name is William Gonal. G-U-R-N-A-L-L. -L, William Gonal. The only work that will abide for eternity is that which is produced in humble dependence upon the power of God's Holy Spirit. Not on your own ability. Not on your own knowledge. Not on your own qualification. If you carry yourself that way, you will go far. Praise the name of the Lord. I have my note here. I said, no matter the avalanche of our natural tools, our resources, our program, let the Spirit of God be our guide. And let's give him back the glory at all times. If we lose this perspective and we forget how big our God is, we will also become easily discouraged and frustrated. This same thing didn't happen to Elijah. He was telling God when he was running away from Jezebel that I am tired. I am the only one remaining in this city of Israel. Before God appeared to him in spirit that no, there are more than thousands of you in this land that still carry my mantle. If you think you are at the center stage, watch it. Watch it. Can you say watch it? Watch it. Hey, if you think that you are, you are high there, I'm repeating. Watch it. <laughs> Oswald Chambers is another respected 20th century Scottish Baptist uh, 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 evangelist. And he's a teacher. And he won against this very well in his, in his book. Our mortal circumstances, listen to what he said. Our mortal circumstances are the means of manifesting how wonderfully perfect and extraordinary pure the Son of God is. Because what? We are mortal. Our God is immortal. <laughs> no matter our level of accomplishment, we must never forget how little we are in God's hand. There is a Bible portion that says God stays in heaven and is looking at us in this world just as grasshoppers. Can you say grasshopper? Grasshopper. Uh, so, when you begin to have this kind of attitude that is true all sense of pride and self-sufficiency, you know, it will make you realize silently every day of your life that everything starts and ends with God. Not with you. Not with you. You are not in the equation. It's just using you as a tool. Pronto. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. So, we have dealt with those attitudes that we must identify and run from. Those are the examples that I have. I have four for you. But let's go into an, another part. The positive attitude that we should imbibe or build so that we can constitute ourselves, you know, uh, uh, <clears throat> so that we can begin to constitute ourselves from removing those impediments from our, <clears throat> our Christian faith. So I call it, you know, like a, a minister's ethical responsibilities. These are things you should be working on every day of your life. And I know God helping us, he will, he will get us there in the mighty name of Jesus. Number one, accept responsibilities to serve or minister from your heart. Can you beat your chest, please? Accept responsibilities to serve or minister from your heart without public recognition. Don't let them be calling you before you work for God. Oh. They don't mention my name. Pastor, don't call me. I'm not called into the meeting. But now, you need to send an error. It is me that is this. Ah. Accept responsibilities to serve, to minister from your heart without waiting for any public recognition. Jesus is our example. 
when he was writing to the Philippians, Paul testified of Jesus in this way. In chapter 2, verses 5 to 11, I know many of us know that verse very well. He said, let this mind be in you. Again, you know I told you that attitude is a thing of the mind. The frontal lobe of your brain, right? Is sitting there. That's how you think. That's how you are wired. Hmm? Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Verse 6. Who being the form of God, he did not consider it robbery to be equal with God. But he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a born servant and coming in the likeness of men. You all know that Jesus is God, but he came like a man. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and he became obedient even to the point of death. Even the death on the cross. Therefore, can we say therefore? Therefore, can we say therefore? Therefore, once more, therefore, God has also exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those on earth, of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Praise the Lord. Humility is built in on this point. Please, don't be a wuga minister. Let humility be written all over you. Invite bit to the fullest. Number two, focus on your spiritual formation far higher than your personal charisma. Mm. Your spiritual formation, your closeness with God. Focus on that. Higher than personal charisma, your personal abilities. Earnestly, every day, seek the help of the Holy Spirit for guidance in your spiritual growth. Maintain a heart of devotion to the Lord. And when you have that point, when you have that kind of heart, you are subservient unto God. You are giving your heart to a higher heart than yours. Be consistent and above all. Be intentional in prayer and in scriptural studies. Our work as minister is more than specialized knowledge. Than our skill and abilities that we are blessed with or that we have acquired in this secular world. Test and grow more in the spiritual realm. That's why Paul advised the Corinthians. He said, take captive of every thought and make it obedient to the uh, make it obedient to Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 10.5. Do you know, people of God, things that you have learned in the physical world, in the secular world, sometimes want to bring God some form of argument in your heart. That what, what is this saying? Do you know? With what I've known, with what I've studied, what is the Bible telling me here? You have to subdue it and be obedient to Christ. Sometimes it may sound illogical, but that's where God lies. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. In his letter to the, uh, to the Romans, Apostle Paul says, verses 5 to 8, for those who live according to flesh, they set their mind on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded, spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then, those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's part of what Pastor Sam was teaching the morning. If we don't subject our spirit to the law and the realm of God, we are still going to be falling for the work of flesh. May the Lord deliver all of us in the mighty name of Jesus. Number three, orderliness is key. I'm telling you. Orderliness, protocol, follow protocol. To your, is key to your ministerial growth, is key to your Christian growth. 
In 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verse 10, Paul says, and he admonished the church, you know, of Corinth, that all things must be done decently and in order. Let things be done in order. We should set the pace even for the outside world. Doing things orderly. Number four. Live within the ambit of your reality. This might look contrary, but I'm going to explain myself. Live within the ambit of your reality as a human being, even though you continue to aspire for divinity. Hello? Why are we quiet? Hello? <laughs> you better listen. When I started, I told you about the need to be aware of disalignment. But I need to make this clear for you again. As long as we're in the world, we know that we are running a race of divinity. We want to be like who? Like Christ. But at the same time, we have to live within the ambit of our reality while we are struggling to become like Christ. Praise the name of the Lord. So, realize this. Ministry should be a professional practice. Christianity isn't just a religion, but a sacred way of life. I advise you today, people of God, identify a minister, identify a counselor who can provide you with personal counseling as and when needed. You are a human being. You carry blood and vein in your body. Develop an awareness of your personal needs. Know that you are weak. Know that you are vulnerable. Don't take advantage of that vulnerability. Don't exploit or manipulate. Address the misconduct of other sisters, other brothers in your church. There is nothing wrong with it. If you cannot do it, go to the clergy. Don't go to your pastor. If necessary, go through other appropriate means through which you can settle the conflict. But know that as long as you are on this earth, you are still a human being. So you, you, do you know what that means again? Don't expect too much from your sister sitting with you. I'm telling you, don't expect perfection from him now, from your brother sitting down with you. It's still a work in progress. It's a project of God and God will make it to fruition in the name of Jesus. If we begin to match those two realities together, I think we will be better sisters and brothers. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Number five. Be shepherd of God's flock that's put under your care. This is to our ministers. I'm sorry, like I said, as I was preparing this, I want to come into me. Be real shepherd of God's flock under your care. Watch over them. That's the meaning of a shepherd. You know, not because you must, M-U-S-T, but because you are willing. There are two different things. Be willing to be a shepherd of God's children. Praise God. It's not by compulsion. Let it be flowing from your heart to love them, to shepherd them. That's what God wants you to be. So, don't pursue dishonest gain. Be eager to serve. Don't lord it over them. As the, as the world will lord it over their subjects. Hello. In the book of 1 Peter, chapter 5, verses 2 to 3, it is clear there that God wants us to be shepherds who will serve people, who will direct them to the way of salvation. So your service, people of God, is an offering before God. Let it smell like an aroma that God will send. And we say, yes, this is my son. This is my daughter doing the work that I committed into his hands. You know, some smells are repulsive, right? Some odor are not good. But when God sees, sees, the, sees the scent of your service, 
you know, he begins to be happy with you the more. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. I'm going to stop here because the, the timer is telling me to stop. Give me one minute and we can round up now. Like I said, there are attitudes and there are attitudes. Yes, repeat it. There are attitudes and there are attitudes. Number one, I have a collection of them in this book of Jonah. Number one, he was an unrepentantly disobedient man of God. Despite that, he knew God. Oh. Hello? He knew God. Oh. You know how we speak in Nigeria, for emphasis. He knew God. Oh. I trace it from Second Kings. But he was an unrepentantly disobedient man of God. In chapter 1, we saw his disobedience. We saw his adverse attitude for God's redemptive plan for the souls as Nineveh. In chapter 3, I also see repentance. It's another attitude from the Ninevites. As soon as they heard the preaching of Jonah, they did what? They all repented. Even up to their king, the Bible says that they wore mournful dress, right? In those days, they would pour ashes on themselves just to show, you know, how distasteful their life has been to them. They did everything. And God did what? God also showed another attitude. Mercy and deliverance. Even though his plan for them is to clear them before. But because they repented, he showed them mercy. Praise the name of the Lord. In chapter 4, another attitude. We read of uh, uh, Jonah's hunger, right? It's an attitude. It's dislike for God's favor on the Nineveh. Also in chapter 4, I see another attitude. He's a complainant. Mm -hmm. He's complaining that he knows that God will favor them anyway. Whether he goes there to preach or he doesn't go. And that's the same way. I need you to look at it from your own lens now. That you complain of virtually everything on this planet. Earth. Complain, complain, and complain. No moment of gratitude unto God, your creator. Praise the name of the Lord. Above all, another attitude. I saw God's loving character. I saw God's mercy pervading the story from chapter 1 to chapter 4. From the beginning to the end. Number 1, Jonah was delivered from that big belly fish. He was safe, he was unharmed, and he was vomited to Nineveh shore. Number 2, God ensured and he helped Jonah to finish his, his assignment, even though he's a runaway evangelist. Can you imagine? God can be so loving. Number three, God saved those Ninevites from impending destruction as well. Number four, another attitude. The boat that is going to Tashish did not capsize, even in the face of the turbulence. Can you imagine God? Safety, security in the midst of turbulence. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you. We bless you for your word. And I pray, oh God, that we expand it more. And I can tell your people, in the name of Jesus, let there be deliverance in this house. Let there be understanding. Let our eyes of insight be opened in the name of Jesus. That we may carry the right attitude to serve you. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen.